we have a big burden on us. We have to make this really good. We're dealing with some really difficult, intractable problems. We're going to cover the whole globe. We're going to do it in 30 minutes, and then we'll let them go off and party on the lawn. <laughs> Uh, uh, a great panel to, uh, to uh, tackle these topics. Uh, Caroline Bucky is the, did I pronounce that correctly? Good. You're the Associate Director of the Center for Communica Communicable Disease Dynamics. Yeah, the Center for Infectious Disease Dynamics was taken, so. You, <laughs> uh, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Julie Gerberding uh, was the head of the Centers for Disease Control, which is where I got to know her, now as EVP and Chief Patient Officer at Merck. Uh, Carla Crewitt is the uh, EVP and Head of Connected Care at Philips. And Peter Sands runs the Global Fund for AIDS, AIDS Malaria, and Tuberculosis. That's right. Got it right. Good. Julie, I want to start with you because you said something really interesting when we were preparing for this panel. You said that, that it, uh, with these kind of big intractable problems that we're talking about, there are, kind of, there are three things that drive innovation. One is people who want to do good in the world. It's a good thing. One is people and companies that want to make money. Uh, and one is crisis. So explain what you meant by that. Well, I think crisis is the aspect of the three that really creates the urgency and motivates action. And we see so many examples of that in the global health arena, but one that's on my mind right now today is the situation halfway around the world in the DRC, where now more than 1,024 people have been diagnosed with Ebola in a setting that is also characterized by a tribal war being fought with machetes and absolutely brutal um, treatment from a humanitarian perspective. So in a context like that, where it actually meets all three criteria, it's a humanitarian issue. There are people who are there from economic perspective, but mostly the crisis is motivating urgent interventions. We are using our experimental Ebola vaccine there, but that's just one of several innovations that have emerged in the context of the emergency. Um, I think you're going to talk a little bit about the use of uh, GPS monitoring of the mobility of people. We've seen ample opportunities for drone technology and innovation in that setting as well. So a lot of the things that might happen at a certain pace under ordinary circumstances in the setting of these uh, innovation accelerators really allows us to speed up, um, experiment, and really move the needle on the dial. Caroline, you, you worked on a great case of that in Puerto Rico. Uh, certainly a, a major crisis. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience? You you agree with this notion that crises drive innovation? Yeah, um, actually the Puerto Rico study was a, a deviation from my normal path. I'm an infectious disease epidemiologist, but I'm interested in outbreaks and they are absolutely, uh, they can be both humanitarian issues as well as crises in a real sense. Um, and the work that I've been doing for several years now is um, in collaboration with mobile phone operators um, and other companies that have data on population displacement. And we use that in combination with epidemiological data um, to figure out where we place resources to contain outbreaks and, and also in forecasting how, you know, where is everyone going? Where do we need to put surveillance? Um, the Puerto Rico study was um, an opportunity at a, at a time when it was most needed. There was no data coming out on mortality. And, and one of the big questions in relation to this mobility problem that happens in all of these crises is, what's the denominator, right? You have something, some instance of disease, and, and we don't know what the population at risk is, and we don't know how, how they're moving around. Um, and in that case, we used new kind of digital approaches where we used satellite imagery to um, define how easy it was to get between different areas of the island, and then, um, and then we used uh, sort of these interoperable survey tools to quickly do the study. We did the whole study in a couple of weeks. We wrote it up in a couple of weeks. We made all the data available, all the code available. Um, so and, a, and did it make a difference in dealing with the Yeah, crisis? within, um, I mean, so there was no, no data that had been released up until that point, and four days after the study, all the data was released. Yeah. Um, so it had immediate policy impact. And, and so these, and Julie, your point is what's happening in the DRC, what happened in Puerto Rico, this will influence how we deal with crises in the future. That's, that's what I've observed in my time at CDC and since, that 
Um, innovation is you know, an ongoing process, but when you have these crises, it's an accelerant. And you see things that come out of the necessity of the crisis that then lead to subsequent sort of serial innovations that um, can solve problems another way. And let me give you a very specific example. We are working on um, some drone technology that came to be a priority for us also in Puerto Rico in the context of not being able to get medicines that people needed for life-threatening conditions after the Hurricane Maria. Um, thank goodness for Federal Express because ultimately we found motorcycles that would allow people to get through all the barriers and get it there. But this led us to understand that we needed air transportation at a small scale. So we've been working on that, but in the course of that um, crisis intervention, we've also now realized that in the context of climate change, it's a lot more expensive for us to transfer cold chain vaccines and other medicines on hot days than it is to put them in the truck and ship them on a cold day. And the cold chain technology that we built into our drone and the data that allowed us to understand the temperature conditions of transport are now being repurposed or thought about differently for ordinary supply chain interventions wow. in the context wow. of the temperature environment. Fascinating. Peter, you're, you're dealing with three of the most intractable uh, diseases that, that, that infect the earth, uh, AIDS, malaria, uh, tuberculosis. Are you seeing innovations that are, that are making a significant difference? Well, in a funny way, the Global Fund itself was uh, a striking example of an institutional innovation in that it brought together civil society, the public sector, the private sector in a, in a common mission um, to fight the three diseases. And, and yeah, we are um, involved with private sector partners in all sorts of different ways, whether it's next generation bed nets for malaria, new tools to fight um, HIV. Um, but it's not just by medical tools, it's innovations in how things are delivered. So for example, um, with TB, one of the big issues in many countries is that people first access services through private sector providers who may not be linked into networks for disease reporting and treatment. And so in India, we've worked with both the private sector providers and literally hundreds of them and some big NGOs to create a, um, a, a, a common network for how to identify, diagnose, and treat TB patients. And one of the things that's um, exciting about the Global Fund is the sheer scale. Um, I was just asking somebody um, before I came here as to quite how big this was. And they said, well, we've, we've got 49 cities which have a population of over 800,000. And we have 406 cities which are under 800,000. So we're talking about a, a, a massive um, um, scale. So those sorts of innovations are very much part of what we do. Um, this, the data side of it is um, massive um, and we're working with a number of different uh, uh, players on how to use data more effectively, how to gather data. Um, so for example, if you take the, the issue of vector resistance to um, insecticide impregnated bed nets, so increasingly mosquitoes are becoming resistant to some of the more conventional insecticides we've been using. We've been working with providers to develop an, another generation of bed nets, um, but they are going to be more expensive. So the question is, where do you use them? The answer is, you use them where the resistance is, which of course means you need incredibly targeted geospatial mapping of where we're seeing pockets of resistance. And when you're talking about doing this in some of the more remote, difficult places in the world, that's an interesting technology yeah. challenge. Yeah, now Peter, you came to this from the private sector. You were a banker. Correct. It's not immediately clear what the connection is <laughs> between banking and infectious diseases. Some people may have a notion of that, but what, what, are there things you learned in the banking industry that helped you do this? Well, I was struck by your comment at the beginning about innovation being driven by uh, people who want to do good, people who want to make money, and by crises. Well. There's certainly plenty of two of those things in the um, uh, banking industry. Although you could argue that the causality went, went the other way, that, that the crises were caused by the innovation rather than the other, uh, other way around. Um, 
so, so yeah, no, it's a, it's a somewhat different mix of um, motivations that you, that you see. A um, couple of things, though, that I think are, that I have taken from my experience in the banking industry, which I, um, I think are relevant. What, one is the obsession with data. I mean, the reality is the financial services industry has much more granular data and much, much faster. It's, it's the speed of the data that astonishes me. So, for example, we get a world malaria report produced in November 2018, which tells us what happened in 2017. Given that malaria is a disease that can vary by 20, 30% a month, knowing what happened 18 months ago is not terribly useful. Um, uh, and so we, we need in the global health world to get the data m both much more granular, but, but just simply get it faster. Um, and, and that, I think, is, that is, I think, is something the financial services world learned a long time ago. Yeah. Carla, I think Philips is a great example of the first two motivations. A company that wants to make money, but a company that really is devoted to doing uh, good in the world. I mean, the, the, I, I believe, where's Cliff? I think you were on the Fortune Change the World list for that, uh, uh, for having done that. You're trying to reach three billion people in the world. A lot of healthcare companies are trying to reach a smaller group of, of wealthy people. Can you talk about how that works? Yeah, that's our vision, improving lives of 3 billion people by 2030. And it's ambitious. And honestly, we were behind with that target. And we got together and say, OK, we have to do things differently. We can talk a lot about transformation needed in the industry, but how do we need to transform ourselves to really reach that goal? And that's, that goal is something we are dead serious about. We measure our people against it. We employ consultants to tell us you know, what exactly counts and what doesn't count. It's a real target. And we decided to go far more in underdeveloped areas, so to reach at, re at least 400 million uh, in Africa and in Southeast Asia. We partner with companies like AMREF and the um, Kenyan government, the local governments, for community life centers. And we changed our thinking coming from a first a technology approach. And again, it's not just about charity. It goes far beyond charity. It's about getting insights on uh, the durability of the products, um, the price of the products, the value proposition, but then also the ecosystem. Can you give us what, a couple examples of, of the yeah, So if you go to a community life center right now, which didn't exist before, first of all, when you drive there, you see what an amazing economic impact it has because you see lots of shops that kind of popped up that are supporting that center. Then you see a fully functional community hospital connected um, data-wise with the more university hospitals around in Nairobi, but very much also training community workers so that they are ready for crisis, and that there is a sustainable support. Yeah. And that kind of ecosystem building it's new for us. We didn't do it before. We are a technology company. We are learning it as we go, and it's exciting. Can you make money doing it? We make money with leveraging what we learn. Right now, we don't make money with that specific projects, but the learning we get is something we can commercialize. Fascinating. I want to open it up to questions in just a minute, but before I do that, I'd like this, is, this has actually been a very optimistic conversation, even though we started with some very dire crises in, in the DRC and in Puerto Rico, whatever. I wonder if you could talk about, as you watch these things play out, the one thing that makes you optimistic, but then one thing that, that, that worries you that we haven't gotten our arms around yet. I don't know who wants to go first. I'm putting you on the spot with this question. So. I'll go first. Yeah. Um, so I am optimistic with respect to the advances that we're making with technology in, in the West. So sequencing technology, yep. genomics, paper-based diagnostics that are multiplexed for multiple pathogens, these are great. The thing that I worry about is that we tend to be excited about technology um, with respect to national level um, structures. And I think we need to really work on, to build technology into the community healthcare worker level, like what Carla was saying. We have to be thinking about where the rubber hits the road in the most vulnerable communities. Um, especially in, in low- and middle-income countries. Yeah. So that translational piece. Julie. 
I'm excited by, about the leapfrogging that I see. You know, the classic example is, you know, you don't put up telephone poles, everyone has a cell phone. But I think that leapfrogging in, in these rapidly growing countries is really allowing them to have their own sense of optimism and their own sense of outlook. What I'm worried about is that many times we in the West um, still have a very traditional sort of paternalistic point of view about what these countries and what these citizens are capable of. And our mindset is, we will come in and help you solve your problem, rather than let's be true partners. You have a lot to teach us about disruption that we can bring back and reverse engineer into our own systems and our own um, solution set. So uh, I, I feel pessimistic in that sense that we have a lot of waste of energy and we're really not creating sustainable solutions as a consequence. I feel very optimistic about the partnership approach all around. Uh, the partnership, partnership approach. approach, even between competitors, where people are really rallying around. A, um, Is that new? Course. I mean, there's more. It, it happens more new. now. I think it's absolutely new. Also, the way we develop technology. Yeah. I mean, we are not developing anything that is not open anymore. Yeah. Right? We don't develop closed systems. Uh, we don't start everything with, OK, what IP will we get and how to commercialize it. So it's a different it's a mindset, yeah. which is and, exciting and, and will really also in developing countries change a lot because you get far more innovations in from startups, from universities, all across. And what worries you? What worries me is the lack of speed and the lack of scaling. I think there are still too many pockets of excellence and great projects, uh -huh. but when you really try to scale it even across many countries, uh, quite some hurdles on the political side, less on the technology and the mindset. So I think we all need to work on that. Peter. Um, I'm optimistic partly because we've demonstrated that we can uh, beat the big infectious diseases. Yeah. Um, deaths from AIDS, TB, and malaria are roughly half what they were yep. a decade ago. Still too many, but they are significantly reduced. And because there's enormous innovation and energy and a great spirit of collaboration. Um, what am I depressed about? Um, can I take two things? Um, one is, <laughs> one is um, the fact that any notion of global solidarity seems much weaker than it was at the time of the genesis. We're headed of the in the opposite fight. direction. We're headed in, it's all too easy not to care about um, people. Uh, and people are a bit battle weary about HIV. Um, most people don't realize that TB is the biggest killer among infectious diseases. Malaria kills children, yes, but they're very far away. You know, there's a sort of, um, that I, yeah, and, and the second thing actually, I'm very struck by the fact that the business community is not really engaged. And of course, this is the wrong set of people to talking to because by the fact that you're here, you are engaged. But if you talk about the broader business community, all of um, companies across multiple sectors, banks, consumer goods companies, airlines and things, they're not really engaged in global health in the way that they engage in issues like the environment. And somehow or other, we need more of that broad energy delivery innovative spirit. Why, why do you think that is? Why would something like the environment uh, motivate companies for social purpose more than health? It's a really good question. And to, to, to put some numbers to it, um, uh, we looked at the Fortune 500 companies and looked at how many of them had strategies or targets around the environment and how many of them had it around global health. And it was really quite striking. Um, around the environment, 74%, and around health, 10 And if you stripped out the pharma companies and so on, it was ridiculously it's low. But, but it's clear, yeah. right? It's much easier to link it to your business purposes. Every airline can have an environmental story really right away. It's harder to do that with global but, health. But, but you know, it, did, it, it, didn't, it took time. It, I mean, it's really been in the last decade that that 74% has happened. So maybe you need to make the same thing happen but, in but there's another there's another thing that I think is beginning to emerge, and that is that slowly but surely, we are beginning to understand that these areas that had no health systems are getting universal health coverage. 
they're coalescing these project-based philanthropic sorts of health models into something that's beginning to resemble a health system, and that's the first step toward a health market. So if you have a very long view and you're in the, in the health sector, you can begin to see that you there's opportunity You can start to see a, a, a route towards profitable right. business. And on top of that, we have impact investing. You know, people who are really interested in not necessarily maximizing their return on investment, but optimizing it with wanting to do good while they're in that Has space. it helped Phillips uh, in terms of uh, 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 profits, in terms of investors, in terms of employees? Definitely. Reputation. You're part on those lists? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I also think, sorry, I just want to say that, you know, from the, in the context of pandemic preparedness, you know, this is something that companies have to think about. You know, if, if the Philippines has a massive epidemic, then all of international shipping goes them. down and... They don't nearly enough. The they reality don't think is, about yeah, it. they don't. Companies don't do it nearly systematically enough. No. Yeah. I'm with... Agree. Questions or comments? Adam. Thank you, Adam Lishinsky with Fortune. I, Peter, would you just expand a little bit because I'm, I'm listening to what you're saying and I'm really having trouble processing it. I would think that multinational corporations by definition would be interested in global health. So this 10% versus 74% is almost incomprehensible. So can you try again why, the, why, why the, I mean, because the environment is actually not that tangible immediate intellectually yeah. yeah i mean it's it's sort of esoteric compared to health yeah no i mean i i share your puzzlement um so i i think part of the reason to be honest is that the um the activist community in the environmental climate change space yeah. took a very different strategy from the global health community the activist community in the environmental space decided to engage with corporates, both collaboratively and also in a challenging way. And they use things like regulations, regulations on disclosures about carbon footprints and things like this, as, as tools to get, to get companies to think more about these things. I actually think that the global health community needs to take a long, hard look at the way it's engaging with the private sector and say, what can we learn from the way the environmental community did it to get that kind of specificity um, and, and directness in the interaction. Because at the moment, at the moment there's deep antipathy um, and huge amounts of mistrust. Um, it's one of the things that surprised me as a relative newcomer is just how distrustful of the private sector much of the global health community um, is. And you're just not gonna get, that's a really poor starting point from, for, for any kind of collaboration. Fascinating, but again, that was that would have been. You could have said the same thing about the environment 15 years ago. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So it, you know, it's that, a relatively changed. recent yeah. phenomenon, and yeah. it can be. And I, I think we should change it. We're we're actually uh, we're going to have Jeff Immelt here on the stage tomorrow afternoon. It was around that. It was 2008 or so in yep. the U.S. when the the coalition for climate change started to come together and change that dynamic. Um, uh, who else? See, this is a crowd that's very eager to get to the alcohol, I can tell. <laughs> one, one last question or comment. Okay, then I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you, and we only have two and a half minutes to do this, but what's one thing you would like to see happen to help us make pro uh, progress on these global intractable diseases? Anyone who wants to go first can, so the others have more time to think about it. You know, I would just start out with the notion of the commitment to global health security. I think this is the, as you were saying, this is the, really the first place to start. We are highly connected and the threat anywhere is the threat everywhere. Um, so we have an enlightened self-interest in getting involved in this space and I think really actualizing the global, global health security agenda and getting not just the private sector, but governments and the, the people with resources to really come together and get serious about bioprotection and preparedness. Yeah, yeah. interesting. Quite I would say a shift from acute care to prevention and home care, both from the government reimbursement side, but also from the company solution NGO cooperation. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, like I'm a scientist and 
For me, I, I really would like to see interoperability of data streams and in surveillance data um, prioritized in health systems. I think that would change everything. Uh, Peter. Um, one of the things that has struck me as being most powerful um, in coming into my role, and which now I would do things early in my career differently if I had realized this, is um, the engagement of communities affected by diseases in the solutions um, that are being offered to them. Um, and I think we could make that much, much more pervasive than we do. So, for example, um, the people who are most vulnerable to HIV infection now are adolescent girls and young women in southern and eastern Africa. Um, there are an awful lot of propositions and programming which is essentially done to them. We've been trying to do a whole bunch of things where we engage them in the design of the programming to um, help them. And it's incredibly powerful. And you always get massive insights into things that you, you, you cannot come up with if you're not actually part of those communities. Good. Thank you. Thank you, all four of you. Great panel. Uh, difficult. I do feel more optimistic than I did when we walked in here uh, 30 minutes ago. So thanks for that. Thank you. Thank you.